please turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. It's exciting to get to be able to to, to be in Isaiah 9 again. Uh, this, is a, this is a passage that uh, I've tried to preach on three times. So, uh, uh-oh, I shouldn't have said anything. Um, well, as we kind of get everything up and going again or not, uh, just a couple things to, to remind you of. Uh, first of all, I just want to continue to ask you to pray for the, uh, the building uh, ministry and kind of our potential plans there. Uh, we were kind of working toward a, a building, several building plans right now. I had some great conversations with lots of folks and very grateful for all those who are working on that ministry right now. And uh, we're, we're looking right now at what, it would, what would it look like for us to be able to have a facility that would have both a dedicated worship space and a uh, and additional Christian education space for our different Christian education ministries. And so continue to be praying about that, continue to, to seek how the Lord uh, might have you be involved in that ministry, both through uh, whatever gifting God has given you, also financially, of course, our family is kind of talking through how we can be involved in that because we know it's going to require a great deal of commitment on all of our parts to be able to to uh, to uh, to complete this this building. So be thinking through through that in your life as well, and excited about some of the plans that have, that have come back and looking at those and kind of continue to talk through those. So we'll, we'll continue to give you updates as, as we have them. And then also just want to remind you, we're, we're talking about some amendments to our constitution and bylaws. We're going to be talking about that on February the 10th as we talk about eschatology or the, story, the study of end times and how that relates to our new teaching statement. And then we'll also on March 3rd, continue that conversation. And then before the March 3rd service, We'll have kind of a, a Q&A about any of the changes to the Constitution and bylaws. And so uh, we've talked through most of the teaching statement changes on Sunday nights. And on, on February, we're going to talk about some of the categories of changes in the bylaws. And uh, you, can, you can look all those changes online. How are we doing behind me? Oh, nice. Um, I haven't seen that before. That looks very nice. Um, we're in Isaiah 9, and uh, just as a reminder, uh, this I, I kept the title Christmas in there because uh, it's still January, and Whitney and I were, on, were, were getting ready to, to drive to Indiana yesterday, and I was talking about how she could have the opportunity to, to listen to me talk about my, my message, and she says, didn't I listen to this message on the way back from Kentucky? And I said, yes, but uh, it's, it's way better now. Um, lots of changes. Uh, never mind. And we didn't end up talking about it. But anyway, um, this is uh, this, this passage. Let me just give you a little bit of reminders. We come to Isaiah 9, what's taking place. Remember, this is a time in Israel's history. It's the late 8th century. Israel has been divided into two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom of Israel or Samaria and the southern kingdom of Judah. And at this time, there is a king in the southern kingdom in the kingdom of Judah named King Ahaz. And King Ahaz is worried about what's going to happen with this northern kingdom, with the kingdom of Israel. And he's worried that, about the threat that Israel poses to him and to his reign. But instead of trusting in Yahweh, instead of trusting in God, he turns to the Assyrians for help. And it's a very dark time in the nation of of both Israel and Judah, the, the people of God. And so what we see as we come to Isaiah 9 is, is some hope. There's some there's some reasons for, for happiness. There's going to be a release of burden. We see that in verse 4. There's going to be victory. We see that in verse 5. And, and this is kind of the culmination of the whole thing, there is a coming king. There's a coming king, and he's going to reign over a kingdom, and that should be a source of joy as well. So if you are able to this morning, if you'd stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together, and I'm going to read the first uh, few verses here of Isaiah 9, the first seven verses. Again, we're really looking at verses 6 and 7 this morning. Verse 1, but there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. 
You have multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. And then we come to verse 6, the culmination of the joy here. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of, the, and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You may be seated. May God encourage your souls this morning as we read his word together. And Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this passage. We thank you for your word that we've been able to, to meditate on. Uh, we're able to meditate on this, these, these truths over the Christmas season. And now, as we enter into 2019, we pray that you help us to think rightly about your king and about his coming kingdom and our, our present kingdom. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. There's a, a Polish expression. I may have mentioned this expression before. I can't remember. A Polish expression, not my circus, not my monkeys. You ever heard of that before? Not my circus, not my monkeys. It means this. It means if you were to, to walk into a circus and you were to see that the monkeys have escaped and are, are, are just kind of going crazy all inside of the tent and, and wreaking havoc and, and picking, picking up people's hats and throwing them on the ground and saying, tis, tis, tis. If you were to, to see all of that taking place and you were to ask yourself, self, am I responsible for these monkeys? You would, you would say to yourself, no, self, I'm, I'm not. This is not my circus. These are not my monkeys. I'm not, not I'm in charge of these monkeys. It's a very helpful expression. I heard about a year ago, and I've, I've used it a lot. Not my circus. Not, this, I'm not, I don't have ownership over this thing. This isn't something I'm to be concerned about in the same way that the owner is. I mean, I'm not unconcerned that there's monkeys running all over the place, but not my circus, not my monkeys. It's not ultimately my responsibility. Now, that relates somewhat to the, the kingdoms of the world, right? You and I live in a world with, with a lot of kingdoms, and as, as we look at the kingdoms, first of all, we, re we recognize that there are people in these kingdoms who are of eternal value. The, the people who populate these kingdoms are people that have eternal worth, and, and we love them, and, and we have a desire to see them come to know the king of kings. But in terms of the things, the, the things of those kingdoms, the, the things that the people of those kingdoms are concerned about, you and I are not concerned about in the same way. So we have the, the kingdom of work, and the people in the kingdom of work are some, concerned about some things, and, and we're not unaware of those things, but we're not concerned in the same way that they are. There's a kingdom of, of school, and we're not unaware of the things in the, the, that kingdom of school. We're not unconcerned with those things, but we're concerned about them in a, in a different way. We're, we approach money in a different way. We approach politics in a different way. We approach living in a neighborhood in a different way than people who are part of different kingdoms. The way that we respond to the things of this world reveals that this is not our, our ultimate true kingdom. Not my circus, not my monkeys. And when I do respond with frustration, with anxiety, with worry to the things of this kingdom, it reveals that I'm, I'm more a part of the kingdom of the world than I should be or that I would like to think that I am. The worry and the frustration that comes from fretting about the things of, of other kingdoms reveals an unbiblical, a spiritually unhealthy fixation on the wrong kingdoms. And what I want us to do this morning is I want us to just look at Isaiah 9, finish up looking at Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. And as we look at these last two verses, I want us today to just rejoice, first of all. I want us to rejoice in the kingdom, 
in which our king reigns. And then secondly, I want us, as 2019 begins here, to commit ourselves afresh to submission to our king and to his reign. So as, as we look at this passage, let's, let's just first of all rejoice. Rejoice that we are part of a kingdom, the kingdom in which our king reigns. And then secondly, commit ourselves afresh to submitting to his reign in 2019. That 2019 would be a, a year, as, as Mark prayed earlier, that we, we proclaim the, the gospel to people around us by the way in which we respond to the things of this kingdom. Three truths I want us to look at as we begin to look at this passage. And, and as I mentioned two weeks ago, I, even as I think about my dad, there's just a great deal of comfort I take in thinking that the dad was not overly clinging to these kingdoms. He, he wanted to live, he wanted to be a part of this world, and yet and there, there's sadness, of course, but there's joy as I think about him. There's his actions, his disposition made it clear that this was not where his heart was. And so I, I want us to look at three truths here and rightly think about the kingdoms in which God has placed us as we're part ultimately of his kingdom. Number one, here's the first truth. Our current kingdom is broken. The kingdoms in which, the earthly kingdoms in which we find ourselves in, those kingdoms are broken. Now, remember here we are in Isaiah 9 and, and what's taking place? Well, let's, let's, let's think big picture. Remember what God's plan was for his people. When he calls Abraham, when he calls Abram and he says, this is my, my plan for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a, a people. And those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And I'm going to use you to, to bless all the nations of the world. And so in you, all the nations will be blessed. That's God's plan with Abraham. And so he, he preserves Abraham's line. And as it comes to Moses, we, te- we see that he tells Moses that there's going to be a, a coming king. You're going to be a nation of priests. You're going to mediate my grace to the world. And there's going to be a coming king who helps mediate that grace and, and reigns over you as a people. And then we come to the time of David. We see God continuing to work through his people God's plan is that the nation of Israel would be this this place that's a a kingdom of priests and communicating God's grace to all the nations of the world so they can experience his blessing. In fact, as we come to 1 Kings chapter 8, remember what Solomon prays as he dedicates the temple? As he dedicates the temple, listen to what Solomon says a a lot of, of things in that prayer, but listen to what he says about the nations. He says in verse 41 of 1 Kings 8, when a foreigner... He's praying to God, dedicating the temple. He says, when when a foreigner, a person who's not of your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for, verse 42, for they will hear of your great name and of your mighty hand and of your outstretched arms. When he, when the foreigner comes and prays toward this house, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. And so Solomon's vision as he dedicates the temple is that the people of Israel are going to be blessed by God because they fear God. And then the the foreigner is going to hear about what God has done in Israel and the people of Israel, as they are obedient to God, the, the foreigner is going to see that. He is going to come and worship as well. He's going to fear God the same way that God's people fear the Lord. That's the vision for the temple. It's, it's a missions focused, right? And yet what's happened? Even without, in Solomon's own lifetime, the, the purpose for that begins to falter. And by the time of the next generation, the kingdom has been separated in two. There's been schism, and there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And and neither kingdom proclaims their fear of the Lord to the nations around them. In fact, as we come to Isaiah chapter 9, you have this, this King Ahaz in the southern kingdom. And King Ahaz, instead of turning to God in his fear has turned to the Assyrian Empire. It's a dark time for the people of Israel. 
In fact, it's not going to be very many years before the southern kingdom falls and the, the, uh, before the northern kingdom falls, the kingdom of Israel. And then Judah is, is going to also fall in the future. And listen to what the writer of Second Kings says about why the people fe- fell, particularly the people of Israel, but he's also talking about the people of the southern kingdom as well. He says, all this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh and had feared other gods. Talks about how they'd set up for themselves pillars and asherim. They'd worshiped these these false gods. They'd engaged in immorality. They they did all these things that the Lord had said, don't do this. And in verse 13, the Lord had warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers and that I sent to you by my my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen, but were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and the warning that he gave them. They went after false idols. Verse 18, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. In other words, there has been complete and total failure on the part of God's people to live in obedience to him. The purpose for which they are brought into relationship with him, they've they've completely failed. Ahaz, here in Isaiah 9, is being called to trust in God in a crisis, and and he refuses. And as a result of his refusal to trust in Yahweh, the people are suffering, and the people are going to continue to suffer. Their system is, is broken. Their kingdom is a broken kingdom. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to be a part of a broken kingdom? Try really, really hard. Can you imagine what it would be like to have rulers and and people in positions of power who are arrogant and greedy and self-willed, to have a political system in which the people who are put in positions of power don't seek the good of others? Imagine that with me if you can, okay? And it's not just the political world, right? It's not just the political world. The kingdoms of this world are broken, Not just politically, but all the other many kingdoms that compete for our affections. Turn your Bibles really quickly to Matthew chapter 4 if you can. And I want you to look at this passage and and, and just kind of let this, let what happens here in Matthew 4 kind of sear its way into your soul. If you're ever wondering whether or not the kingdoms of the world are are broken and, and, and how much how much you should commit yourself to this world and the things of this world, I want you to think about what happens with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, the, uh, Jesus has just been baptized, and he he's enters into this period of, of testing. And then you come to verse 8, and look what it says in verse 8. It says, again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain, And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and and their glory, all their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Okay. So so here's the deal. Uh, Here are all the kingdoms. Here are all the things that the, the earthly kingdoms can possibly offer you. And all of this is yours if if you worship me. Jesus responds to this deal with with what response? It says in verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So I want you to just, just think about the scenario here. Jesus has offered every kingdom of the world and, and all he needs to do is, is to cease for a moment from worshiping God with his whole heart 
this whole this whole being cease from recognizing the glory of, of the triune God. All he needs to do is to cease doing that for a, a moment of time. And if he ceases doing that for a moment of time, what does he get? Everything you could possibly imagine that this world could offer. And as Jesus has offered that deal, turn away from worship of God for a moment and receive everything that this, this world could possibly offer. As Jesus has offered that deal, what calculation does he make? Not worth it. Now, now why would he come to that conclusion? Well, two reasons. One, because of the absolute infinite value of recognizing and being in a relationship with the triune God. And secondly, because of the brokenness of the kingdoms of this world. Now, what's the application for you and I? The application is this. Many of us have been offered a far less attractive deal and said, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good to me. In other words, we're not even offered all the kingdoms of the world. We're offered a promotion in, in one little tiny kingdom, or, or we're offered a friendship in one tiny part of the, of the kingdom, or there, there's, some sort of smaller, there's some sort of smaller offer that we're given, and we say, I'll take it. And what's God's message to you and to me? Sacrificing a kingdom of infinite worth is not a good deal. To sacrifice it in order to obtain a broken kingdom. Because the pursuit of a promotion, the pursuit of grades, the pursuit of financial security, those things are not going to be kingdoms that bring joy if it costs you the worship, worshiping your heavenly father. Our current kingdom is, is broken we don't trade kingdom, a kingdom of infinite worth for a kingdom of much less worth. How foolish that would be, and yet how often we're willing to trade. Even for a moment of, of failing to, to worship God in all his fullness and his beauty, we'll turn from that. We'll say, just for a moment, just let me turn from this for a moment so I can pursue this, and then I can get back to worshiping God. Don't be a fool. Our current kingdoms are broken. Here's the second truth. Number two, our future king is glorious. Our future king is glorious. We talked about this passage on Christmas Eve. For to us, a, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, when I say future king, I don't mean just future king. He's also our present king, but we're talking about his, his future reign recognized in a, a worldwide setting, everyone acknowledging him. What does this mean for Judah? For Judah, what God is telling his people is, look, there's going to be a child born, a son given, who has the ability to, to, to hold the, the weight of government. Here in the, the context, what's happened is that the people of Judah are longing for a David, but they're stuck with an Ahaz, right? They're longing for a king like David. First Chronicles 18 14 says that David reigned over all Israel and he administered, he administered justice and equity to the people. And that's what the people are yearning for in a leader when they're stuck with an Ahaz. As you go through the book of Isaiah, what you see over and over again is, is these, these truths about bad leadership. A bad ruler, Isaiah tells us, loves bribes. A bad ruler refuses to help the helpless, the foreigner, the widow, the poor. A bad leader is an oppressive leader. He passes unjust laws. We know the pain from Isaiah of bad leadership. It's almost like as Isaiah continues to talk about bad leadership, he's continuing to, to juxtapose that, to compare that with this, this coming king. Here's what a bad leader looks like. And you know the pain of a, of a self-willed, arrogant uh, leader who doesn't care for those with whom he's been entrusted leadership. And then now here's what a good leader looks like, Isaiah says. And the Bible here in the book of Isaiah continues to point people to this, this coming David. They're longing for David. They're stuck with Ahaz as you come to Isaiah 9. Now, there's a couple things I want you to notice. Three things I want you to notice about this king here in verse 6. Number one, 
notice that this king is, is a human being, okay? He's a man. He's, he's human. He's, he's born, right? Unto us a child is born. He enters into the physical world, the physical realm. Deuteronomy tells us about this coming king, Deuteronomy 17, and we've talked about that passage before, but it's a, it's a promise of an of a earthly king, of a human king who will reign over God's people in a, in a physical way. Philippians 2 describes Jesus in this way. He was in the form of God, but did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This king had to be, first of all, human. But secondly, I want you to see this. The king who can lead in this way also must be fully God. I think we talked about this on Christmas Eve, but but look at how the text describes him. And, And as you... This might be kind of a fun thing to, to research if you ever went through the, the book of Isaiah. See how these phrases that are used to describe this king in Isaiah 9 are also used to describe God. So, for example, he's a mighty God, this king is. And yet, as you come go through the book of Isaiah, you see that phrase, mighty God, is used to refer to Yahweh. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God in Isaiah 10, 21. Isaiah 63, 16, you are our father through... Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer of old is your name. There's this, this mighty God, this everlasting Father there in Isaiah as well. Prince of Peace. These are phrases that could only be used to describe someone who was fully God. So this king, this future glorious king, is fully man, he's fully God, and he reigns. It says here, in verse 6, the government will be upon his shoulder. In other words, most leaders, as, you're, as you give them power, what happens? A leader who has power becomes corrupt. They can't handle the, the weight of responsibility, the, the weight of government. The, the more power means more corruption and more incompetency. As, as a person gets more power, it, it reveals their inability to do the things that they'd like to do. And yet, not this king. This king doesn't buckle under the weight of leadership, the, the, the power that he's given. This king allows the government to rest upon his shoulder and is able to execute the duties of a king faithfully. He's Lord. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 says, In those days... In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. A future king reigns. He's glorious. He's fully God. He's fully man. My dad... um, he was, a, he was a natural leader, maybe a, he was a spirit fuel leader in a lot of ways. And after the, the funeral, lots of people I, I know in my life have come to me and, and talked about how they love my dad or they wish they could have known my dad better and some of the encouragements that they got from his life. Uh, and not just believers, right? Unbelievers as well. And uh, my, my dad's first cousin, uh, Buddy, we're from the South. We have lots of names like that. He, he wrote this on uh, my dad's uh, Facebook page. He said, every family should have one, and we did. We had Daryl. Daryl was that good kid, good son, good brother, good college student, good husband, good father, good grandfather, good uncle, good cousin, good Christian, and you can add to the list. This is, this is Buddy writing, and uh, Buddy is a, a pastor he says, but in a blow to my ego, Daryl was my mother's favorite. And it's true. Like, it was very funny. Uh, last time I was, I was with her before uh, she passed away, he's right. My dad's cousin's right there. My great aunt just begins talking about how wonderful all of us are, the Bennett family. Anyway. <laughs> yes, my mother is my... This cousin buddy writing it. Yes, my mother, his aunt, my mother would always talk about Daryl's family, his good wife, his good kids. 
Mom would tell us what a good Christian man Daryl was. My mother didn't just mention a time or two, but over and over whenever she got the opportunity. And here's my, my, uh, here's my, 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 my dilemma. I was a pastor, but Daryl was a Christian to follow. And he was. My cousin was an engineer, but he was a Christian engineer. And everything Daryl did, he did, everything Daryl did, he emulated the Christian man he was. So I was fine with my mother's perception of Daryl's spiritual example because all of you that knew Daryl knew he was all my mother believed him to be. Love you, cuz, buddy, right? Now, my mom replied to that. And she said, just remember that your, your mom only saw the sanitized part of our lives. Daryl had feet of clay just like everyone else. This, this is what she says. She says, but he did have a faithful, consistent heart for the Lord. Which is absolutely true, right? You know, there are parts of my dad's life that, uh, you know, now that I know that he's not watching or listening to the sermons, they're going to become sermon illustrations. Okay, I've got a lot. I've got 40 years of some great sermon illustrations now. But, but, even though there's only one king that deserves our worship, there are people that we can look at in our life and say, okay, there, there's something in their life that, that, that points me to, to, to a coming king. And so you look at a frail leader and say, okay, this is, a, this is a frail leader, a person who's availing themselves to God's grace or herself to God's grace. But even in, the, even in their, their best days, they are still frail people who we don't deserve our worship. The kingdoms of this world, what do, they, what, do they, what do they teach us over and over and over again in their failures? Over and over again, we, we learn the failures of, of political leaders and of, of parents and of, of, of employers. We learn over and over again the frailty of humanity and its inability to lead as we need to be led. How foolish of us to put our confidence and our trust in human beings who are so frail. What a joy it is to turn to a glorious king in, who in his perfection can heal us in all of our weakness and, and all the failings that other people have, have inflicted upon us and all the failures that we have done in our leadership of others. We can turn to this, this king and say, this king is glorious. And that brings us to this third truth that I want to exhort you with, to encourage you with as we begin 2019. His future kingdom is unstoppable. His future kingdom is unstoppable. Verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and of, of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. King Ahaz desperately desired security. He was worried about Israel. He was worried about Syria. He, was, he wasn't worried as he ought to be about the Assyrian Empire that was going to come and wreak such havoc on Israel and even on the southern kingdom. He was foolish. Instead, what should he have done? He should have turned to Yahweh, the, the, the king above all kings, the king whose kingdom can never be shaken or altered, and he should have put his confidence and his trust in that king alone. Why? Because that is the king who's establishing his government. A, a peace that will be no end, a throne that will be established forever. God's passion and zeal will accomplish this. Now, what does this mean for you and for me? Well, God's kingdom continues to come. If you ever really just kind of try to think deeply, what is God's kingdom? What, what is this, this kingdom that God talks about in his word? It, it comes up a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of things we could say. We've talked about this before, but... You come to a passage, like passages in Matthew, you say, okay, the kingdom is, is, is present, but it's also future. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says this, if it's by the spirit of God that I cast out demons and the kingdom of God is, has come upon you, so it's, it's present. And yet he also talks about it in the future tense, Matthew 26, 29, I, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you in my father's kingdom. The kingdom in Scripture refers to, to Jesus and him reigning, but it also refers to a place in which he reigns. There's a lot of things that just seem to be in tension as we come to, to, to God's discussion of his kingdom. And George Ladd put it this way. He said, 
the kingdom is, is about the, the reign or cling, kingly rule of God and, and the place in which this rule is experienced. So in other words, God's, God's reign, King Jesus' reign, is, is something that should be in our minds as we think about the reality that we're part of a kingdom that God is establishing. And, and in many ways, we're already in that kingdom as we recognize Jesus as our king, and yet we recognize there's a future to this kingdom as all people are going to acknowledge God's kingdom and the reign of King Jesus. So what sort of thoughts help us as we think about the coming year? First, I would just encourage us to recognize that we're witnesses of this kingdom, right? As Mark prayed earlier, we're, we're, we're those who are proclaiming this kingdom, and our, our life is going to show people our allegiance. And as we recognize, hey, you know what? Not my circus, not my monkeys. As, as people look at us and see that we are not concerned about the monkeys the same way that they are, what does that show? It shows that we have a different king, a different kingdom. Secondly, we recognize that we're custodians of the kingdom. There's a special life that exists within the walls of the church. And as we live that life out in relationship with one another, it shows that we're part of God's kingdom and we're part of his citizen, the citizens of this kingdom. We pray for other kingdom people. Let me uh, read you something George Ladd wrote. He wrote, as he talked about the kingdom and the good news of the kingdom, he's, and, and us living as ambassadors of the kingdom. He said, this is the good news about the kingdom of God. How men need this gospel. Everywhere one goes, he finds the gaping grave swallowing up the dying. Tears of loss, of separation, of final departure, strain, a stain every face. Every table sooner or later has an empty chair. Every fireside, it's vacant place. Death is the great leveler, wealth or poverty, fame or oblivion, power or futility, success or failure, race, creed or culture. All our human distinctions mean nothing before the ultimate irresistible sweep of the Sith of death, which cuts us all down. And whether the mausoleum is a fabulous Taj Mahal, a massive pyramid, an unmarked spot, of ragged grass or the unplotted depths of the sea, one fact stands, death, death reigns. Apart from the gospel of the kingdom, death is the mighty conqueror before whom we all are helpless. We can only beat our fists in utter futility against this unyielding and unresponding tomb. But the good news, the good news of the kingdom is this. Death has been defeated. Our conqueror has been conquered. In the face of the power of the kingdom of God in Christ, death was helpless. It could not hold him. Death has been defeated. Life and immortality have been brought to life. An empty tomb in Jerusalem is proof of it. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Every person dies, and not just every person, but every kingdom passes away. And so, brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you this morning as you meditate upon the truths of Isaiah 6 and Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, my encouragement to you this morning as we think about how we're going to live 2019, that you would rejoice today in the kingdom over which our king reigns, which can never be defeated, and commit yourself to living under his rule in this year by his grace and for our joy. Let's pray. Father, if you tarry and if you allow, we commit ourselves in this year to you, to your grace. We ask that you would be kind to us. You would cause us to rightly look at the things of this world and consider them as nothing in comparison to, to you that we would not turn our, our hearts aside from worshiping you and, and being committed to you in all your glory, even for a moment, that you would protect us and, and not, let us not turn away even for, for momentary fleeting affections in other places that help our hearts to be continually, steadfastly, immovably devoted to you and to your glory. We pray this by your grace in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.